It's our pleasure tonight to introduce uh, Dr. David Ayadavaya, Ayad Ayad and uh, Dave is actually a past member of Skyscrapers. He was in the Rhode Island area up until about 1983, I believe, at which time he departed for the uh, sunnier and darker skies of Arizona, where he has remained uh, since then. He received a PhD from Pacific Western University in online science education. And uh, as noted in the introduction in our newsletter, The Skyscraper, it was given to him before online education was popular and it wasn't really looked upon too favorably. So definitely a man ahead of his time. Uh, there uh, is, his talk tonight will be about small radio telescopes for amateur astronomy. And he's going to describe the three frequencies used for small radio telescopes and go into the construction of some of these instruments, which uh, are uh, perfect for amateurs that are interested in this, not terribly expensive. And uh, it's a subject that I'm looking forward to because it's not one that we uh, really hear about as much uh, as amateurs, because most of the time when people are talking about building a telescope, it's of the optical variety, so this is going to be a bit different, but I think it'll certainly be interesting because there's a whole area of the sky that we're not getting with our optical telescopes that Dave can certainly help us tap into. Uh, and if you wish to have further details on uh, Dave's background, there's quite a bit more in the newsletter, but I don't want to go on and interrupt any of his time because I think what he has to say is certainly going to be fun and uh, important to hear. So Dave, are you ready to begin? Okay, what I'd like to start with is a prologue to my presentation. And I know many of you know me from years ago, and I know many of you from years ago, and you probably wondered how, do I, how did I end up in Tucson? So I'll give you a brief, uh, little brief tour down the road to Tucson. It all began at the uh, George Agassiz Station at Harvard College Observatory. And uh, years ago, I decided that I needed to get back into uh, astronomy in a, in a big way. And so I took my young son, uh, he's 43 now, but he was five and we went up to um, Harvard and walked through the faculty uh, offices. And uh, I found the door that was open and the door belonged to a uh, uh, a guy that uh, Skyscrapers is familiar with, uh, Dr. David Latham. And I walked in and I, I said to him, I need to uh, get back into uh, what I really enjoy doing. And uh, are you, do you have anything I could volunteer for? And he said, well, as a matter of fact, I have an observing run at the 61 inch at uh, George Agassiz Station, which I had no idea even existed. And uh, so I said, well, when are you going and what do you want me to do? He said, well, just show up next week. Uh, I start on Monday and we run for the week and uh, you know, let's see what, what happens. So every, every night at four o'clock, I'd start off from Smithfield, Rhode Island and drive up to Harvard, uh, Massachusetts and meet Dave Latham. And this facility is, is no longer open, but here was the 61 inch telescope, the largest telescope that was uh, east of the Mississippi, as they say. And uh, of course, being in New England, you got to see a lot of rust and this is me with my head cut off. But this is what we would do at that uh, facility. We would test many of the detectors that would end up in, uh, in Arizona. Well, as I uh, finished my week, he said to me, he said, you know, he says, Tucson is a great place to raise kids. And I said, well, uh, yeah, I guess so. And uh, a day later, I got a call from uh, Stewart Observatory and the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory saying they wanted to see me. I said, well, how do I do that? And uh, they said, well, make the arrangements and we will take care of it. So I did and uh, eventually got hired to work at the Multiple Mirror Telescope. Uh, this was the original road up to the facility. This was the original MMT. It's now the Mighty Mirror Telescope. It's uh, the six mirrors were replaced with one big one. Uh, here's what one of the mirrors looked like and that's me behind the flash. And uh, this, uh, this was a, a very interesting uh, experiment in optical science. Uh, this was what the control room looked like in 1983. I was responsible for this shell spectrograph, which uh, 
weighed a couple of thousand pounds and got hoisted up with a forklift, literally, to the telescope and bolted on. After the money ran out for that facility, uh, for my position, I was hired by the college. Since I had a degree, uh, an associate degree actually, in electronics from Rhode Island Junior College, um, the college was looking for someone to uh, teach electronics. It was uh, the heyday of, uh, of what was going on in Tucson in terms of uh, space exploration. Uh, uh, the Lunar and Planetary Lab was, was going gangbusters. And uh, this uh, telescope I use many nights is a 61 inch used by uh, Kuiper. And this is now used, it's an astrograph that is used uh, for space watch, uh, asteroid detection and, and so on. And the 60 inch telescope on Mount Lemmon. So I've, I spent many, many a night uh, on these, uh, at these facilities. And what was interesting is when you use these facilities, uh, you, you're trained to use them and you're there by yourself essentially so you're the observer and the telescope operator which was rather interesting this is me at the 60 inch and this is me at the astrograph and i was a lot younger then as we all were so what do i do now well i have my own private observatory i'm still active in uh, in astronomy i collect data uh, and i do spectroscopy uh, high resolution and low resolution. Um, this is my observatory, uh, my instrument that I use, uh, one of the spectroscopes. And this is what I'm going to talk about tonight. So now the formal presentation. Um, this is being recorded, so all of this information that I have written down, you can uh, always go back and look at it. Um, if you need any of this uh, stuff that you can't find easily, uh, send me an email and I can uh, send you copies. Alas, the poor Arecibo radio telescope is no more. However, the, the Carl Jansky Very Large Array is just fine. This uh, last summer I was there and on the way over to visit the Very Large Array, I stopped by uh, John Briggs's uh, uh, Lyceum and got to spend some time with John, whom most of you know. So when did this all begin? Well, it all began with the Big Bang a long time ago. And what happened then? Well, during that time, if uh, we look at this timeline, you end up with uh, uh, the, uh, the Big Bang and then uh, the separation of uh, matter from uh, energy, and uh, then things got interesting for us. So the beginning of radio astronomy, as we're familiar with it, uh, dealt with uh, the detection of the Milky Way is a radio source. And of course, this was a big surprise when it happened. Most of what I'm going to talk about is based on non-thermal emission known as synchrotron radiation. Essentially, what you have is an electron that uh, spirals down along a magnetic field line, and in that uh, acceleration change, emits photons. When we look at the uh, atmosphere of the Earth, we find that um, here's the visible portion, which uh, most of us are familiar with, uh, there's a window for we, uh, we can see visible light, some uh, infrared, and then uh, infrared spectrum at this point is blocked off. And then we have a nice little window here for radio uh, astronomy, which runs essentially from 21 centimeters to 15 meters in wavelength, or uh, 1420 megahertz to 20 megahertz. Carl Jansky is the guy that started it all. This is what his antenna looked like. And this was, uh, 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 well, let's see, it was on wheels. And he could turn it uh, 360 degrees. And when he did this, while he was uh, watching the uh, strip chart recorder, he'd notice these, these bumps. And uh, he correctly uh, surmised that he was looking at something that was happening uh, overhead. He had a series of receivers for 20 and a half megahertz. And this was what a typical recording looked like. And I want you to notice the size of this piece of equipment and keep that in mind as we move along. Bro Ruber, a ham radio operator, uh, built a uh, backyard radio telescope, 31 feet in diameter. And uh, so uh, if you thought 
some of your optical systems that you build were, were large in your back, backyard. Uh, this one takes the cake. Now, what's interesting is this is the collecting area, and it's set up as a, a cassegrain, uh, in a sense. Uh, you have this collecting the uh, energy that's, uh, that you're receiving, and it's focused up to where the detector is located. Now, the surface of this will determine what wavelengths you can actually deal with, because the, uh, the finer the surface, the lower the frequency, or the lower the, the smaller the wavelengths, the higher the frequency. And all the detection goes up at the focus. This was a map that he generated of the um, emissions that he received from the Milky Way at 160 megahertz. And this is his actual antenna that's re been reconstructed at the National Radio Astronomical Observatory in West Virginia. Daniel Krauss, PhD, was also a ham radio operator, and he was into uh, radio astronomy, and he built the big ear. Now, this was famous for the wow signal that you may have heard about, where uh, the first detection of something that was unusual out there never happened again. Um, this telescope no longer exists, but it was built by a, a team of students, as usually happens, and uh, was called the big ear. So what is this 21 centimeter emission and how does it happen? During the 1930s, quantum mechanics was gangbusters. It was moving along very nicely. Uh, people were found, finding that they were able to predict uh, the, um, what happens in atoms. And if specifically, they could predict spectral lines. Where prior to that, uh, I remember as a student in chemistry class, we did an experiment with uh, spectra and uh, used Rydberg's constant, and we were able to determine the Balmer lines of hydrogen. And uh, uh, you could probably predict one layer up from that, but uh, that was it. But when quantum mechanics came along, you could predict all sorts of interesting things. And one of the predictions that was made was that an electron, in its, if we use a planetary model of the electron, as it's orbiting, uh, it's fine. It's uh, uh, but if it flips for some reason, during that flip, and, and as flip is a change, you have an acceleration, and you will get an emission of energy at uh, 1420 megahertz or 21 centimeters. Van der Holst was a, a student. Uh, he ultimately, um, he made a prediction while he was a graduate student of the existence of this 21 centimeter hyperfine line of neutral interstellar hydrogen. And uh, he decided that nobody's going to be able to find this. By 1950, there were another group of uh, graduate students um, the, at Harvard, and they heard about his prediction. And um, one graduate student, who affectionately was known as Doc Ewan, was working 40 hours a week designing uh, apparatus for a new cyclotron at Harvard. And he built a receiver with the intention of detecting the 21 centimeter line. The original paper by Van der Hultz predicted the existence, but he expressed the doubt that no one would find it. And yet, and this is rather interesting, the line was detected by you on Easter weekend, 1950. So I guess I'm giving a talk at the 70th anniversary of the, uh, the detection of, uh, of this uh, hydrogen line. This is a uh, picture of Doc Ewan and his uh, advisor and another student. This was the, horn, the original horn antenna. It was set up to do the um, detection in a, a drift scan mode. In other words, you just aim it to some place on the sky and let uh, nature take its course. The Earth will rotate. And of course, you collect all these photons of these uh, very high frequency uh, emissions. And also, you collect a lot of rain. And it would go down into the uh, horn, into the laboratory, down into where the detector is. And again, I want you to notice the size and the extent of all the equipment that's necessary at the time to make that detection. This is Dr. Ewan and his original horn antenna at uh, uh, the National Radio Astronomical Observatory in Virginia was set up in his honor. So now let's fast forward to 2021 from 1951 and build a radio telescope to 
to detect the 21 centimeter hydrogen line. So what do we need? First of all, we need a horn antenna. This horn antenna is cheaply manufactured. You can go to Home Depot, pick up a couple of panels of this uh, aluminized uh, insulated uh, board in four by eight sheets for a couple of dollars, I don't know, nine dollars, whatever. And uh, you could uh, then cut the uh, sections and use some of that nice aluminum tape that uh, makes a nice electrical connect. This has to all be conductive. And way down here, where the resonant cavity is, this was the most expensive part of this whole thing because it's a half gallon or one gallon, uh, one of those rectangular uh, uh, metal tin things that hold uh, paint thinner or what have you. So I went online and I tried to find a manufacturer of these and I did find them and uh, the, they were very inexpensive, like uh, $5 for a can. The problem is you had to have a minimum order of $100 and the shipping was insane. So I went to, to Ace Hardware and for $11, I bought a can of paint thinner and uh, used the can. This is looking down at the business end. Now, what's interesting is all radio telescopes, the detectors are all the same. This is the detector, that piece of wire, all right? This is a half, a quarter wave detector. So it's a quarter wave antenna cut for the frequency that we're interested in and this, can becomes the resonant cavity. This then, remember that big room full of equipment? Well, here you have everything you need. This is the uh, 1420 megahertz amplifier and bandpass filter. And this is what's known as a software defined radio. The antenna plugs here, the computer plugs here. I don't know if you're seeing this. If, uh, you should be able to see something. This is a, a, a type of software defined radio that has more capability than uh, this little one here, but uh, that's it. I mean, this is the room full of equipment that Ewan had uh, during his, uh, his activity. And this is what a typical setup looks like. It's drift scan mode. So the antenna just looks straight up at the sky and the cables come in the USB into the computer and with the appropriate software, you can collect some data. So what does this data look like and what can you actually determine? What I'm gonna show you now is a 10 hour scan using the horn antenna. And while this is occurring, I want you to look right here because right here, what you're seeing is one of the arms of the Milky Way as it passes over the antenna. The rest of this stuff is just noise and I have no idea what that's from. But here you can see the actual buildup of the signal as time progresses for a, a 10 hour um, scan. And you'll start seeing another one occur here. So this is stuff that you're picking up with uh, very inexpensive, I mean, less than $100 for what you need, maybe 120. Okay, and you can see the peak here and you can see here. Now, what you can't see so readily, but I'll show you at a, uh, in another slide, is this thing is actually Doppler shifting because remember the earth is rotating, so we're rotating toward the cloud and away from the cloud. And uh, you can actually see that and measure it. Okay. Ah. So what I did was I used a Stellarium to, uh, to uh, synchronize the time that you're looking at the uh, trace and so this was at 1600 Mountain Standard Time. Uh, the antenna is pointing straight up and here's the uh, Milky Way, okay? At uh, 22 hours, you start seeing these bumps. The Milky Way is now within the field of view of the radio telescope. Oops. And here you have a nice big strong signal 10 hours later as the, uh, the, uh, the rest of the, uh, the Milky Way is passing through the horn. So another type of antenna that you could use that's commercially made is a, a parabolic uh, antenna. And uh, this is what that one looks like. This is specifically for Wi-Fi uh, radio uh, communications over distances. And it's, it's not cut for uh, 1400 megahertz, but uh, uh, 2100 megahertz, but it has such high gain and the signal to noise ratio is such that it works just fine 
as a radio telescope. Problem is, this is about $80. And again, here is the, <laughs> the entire radio room right there. And no, you don't have to cool, you do nothing. You just plug it in and play. And here we have the computer that's collecting the data. So what does the data from this look like? Well, this is an entirely different approach to how you can pick up the, uh, this emission. This program was developed by um, a professor over in Portugal. And uh, he, he's big on uh, radio astronomy. And uh, he has a 60 foot, no, let's see, a 30 foot radio telescope dish. But he developed a series of programs that he freely gives of anyone who's interested. And uh, this way you see here is a time series uh, for 24 hours of that antenna looking straight up. And you can start seeing something happening here and it starts to increase. And here you have uh, the peak of the arm coming through. But well, here's the interesting thing. Look, there is Doppler shifted. So you're actually seeing the motion of everything. And if you're clever enough, you can actually determine the speed at which all this is happening. So you've got the capability of determining uh, the rotation of the Earth. And if you're really clever, uh, what's the Milky Way doing? Is, is there any motion going on there? So you have the resolution capability if you, if you want to do that. And I, someone earlier on said something about students. And uh, this is a good student project. Now, there's sophistication in this program because there's typically lots of noise, all this jumble stuff. And then there's this, which I do know what that is. But when corrected, you can get a nice smooth uh, curve, relatively speaking, so that from here to here, removing the, uh, the noise with his program. This then is uh, using a 24 hour run during the, uh, uh, the same period. Um, but what I did was I, I tipped the antenna at 45 degrees and aimed it due south. So now, and what's interesting about radio astronomy, of course, you can do all this during the day as well. So here we have the same effect. We're looking at uh, arms and we're seeing a Doppler shift. And this is my security camera, <laughs> the output from my security camera. That's that big chunk of noise. So uh, uh, you, you, there's a lot of radio noise around. So especially at the frequencies you're gonna be using because of Wi-Fi and whatnot. Okay, so now here's another interesting thing that, that happens, and I'm going to be talking more about this in a moment. But here is a, uh, the effect of the sun that passes through the beam. I, I aimed the, the uh, antenna at the altitude that I aimed it so that I knew the sun was going to cross the beam. And uh, if you want to guess, where did that happen? Right here. The sun affects the ionosphere, right? And as a result of that, uh, these were the emissions that I'm picking up uh, prior to the solar crossing the field of view and then uh, uh, post crossing. And you can see everything's looking fine. But when the sun was in the field of view, it sort of knocked everything down. Now, of course, you can uh, monitor the sun at certain radio frequencies as well. So now we come to another way of uh, observing um, using radio astronomy techniques to observe what's happening. And this is radio. Jove. Radio Jove, uh, it deals with Jupiter as a radio source at 20 megahertz. And what's interesting here is that, um, go forward, there we go, uh, the discoverers of Jupiter's radio emissions, uh, uh, Dr. Franklin and Dr. Burke, um, what were they doing? Well, they were just aiming, there they, here's their antenna, just a wire, bunch of wired dipoles lots of them over a field. And uh, they noticed this very interesting uh, periodic noise that occurred. And so they researched this a little bit uh, more and discovered that the radio emission at this frequency was coming from Jupiter. So a typical radio Jove antenna would look pretty much like that. And uh, it's two dipoles that you'd set up. And uh, the uh, the dual dipole schematic is shown here, very inexpensive to make. The most expensive part of this, because this whole process is very formalized now, is the receiver that you would use. Now, I've used um, a sh short wave receivers that you can use as well, tuned to that frequency. And uh, this then uses uh, um, 
within this, it uses the, the audio input into the computer through the sound card, and you can pick up what's going on. So something like this you could put up at, uh, at uh, Seagraves if, if that's what you wanted to do. And it's very impressive to look at, but doesn't make an awful lot of noise. And the emissions from Jupiter uh, are due through the uh, non-thermal radiation, but they're not consistent. And the reason that we have them has to do with the rotation of uh, Jupiter and the moon Io around Jupiter. So if we're looking at Jupiter from the Earth, when these uh, regions marked A, B, and C are in our line of sight, and if Jupiter is doing anything, then you're going to receive a signal. I don't know if you can hear that. Are you able to hear that? I can't see anyone there, but Jim Henderson, if you can hear that, could you give me a thumbs up? I'm not hearing it. Okay. Yeah, I'm not either. Okay. I don't, I don't know how that's supposed to work. Well, anyhow, if you were listening, yeah, if you could hear it, you'd hear. And then it would make some other weird sound. But uh, I, for some reason, I'm, I, I guess I should have figured that out beforehand. The sun can also be detected at 20 megahertz. And if you, you plot this with uh, uh, various programs that are available, then you get to see this characteristic uh, shape of the, uh, the solar emission. And let's see, I'm gonna try another audio. Let's see if this one works. Uh, nothing. I think it's because you have headphones in. Oh. Well, let's disconnect those. Uh oh, pull the wrong plug. That's power. Okay. Let's try that again. Let Let's see if this one will work. How's that? Yep, we can hear it. Okay. You can hear that? Okay, great. These are the actual sounds at the various fine. You notice what's happening here is I was making one, one complete uh, rotation. So these, these emissions are not really predictable. I mean, they, they can be predicted when you think you might hear them. And so you have your equipment set up and you let it run all the time and then all of a sudden, oh, I just heard something and you're amazed. Let's see, there we go. So here's what the sun would sound like. And there you go, that's the sun. Now you can get emissions from uh, sunspot groups and they'd show up a little weird in a little weird way like this. So now the next and the final way of detecting uh, or using uh, radio amateur equipment uh, would be to detect uh, solar flares at very low frequencies. We're talking uh, 10 to 40 kilohertz. And there is a, of course another project which is run by Stafford University Solar Center. It's called Project SuperSid. This is what the equipment looks like. They send you one of these, okay? There's no cost. And uh, what you do is you hook it up to your sound card and then to the USB port on your computer. And this, this end goes to the antenna. And the antenna, I'll actually show you what the antenna looks like. And you can place these antennas anywhere. That's the antenna. It's just sort of sitting in my office right now, hanging on my bookshelf. 
but it will actually work in here because very low frequencies have a tendency to uh, uh, be very easily detectable. And what's happening here is um, this is a 24-hour sweep. Again, you just leave the antenna up and uh, let nature take its course. And at night, you'll get all this information from radio stations. And it's not haphazard because the radio stations that are used are typically naval uh, radio stations that are used either for submarine communication or whatever else that the Navy likes to do with radio waves. But at noon, everything quiets down. So you can see sun, uh, sunrise here and daytime and then sunset and then the activity starts again. So here, what, um, if the sun is now active, you'll get a series of, uh, of uh, blips and these are actual solar flares that you can correspond in time with what's happening uh, uh, at that time using other, other uh, facilities that are available. But you can actually see this. Uh, for uh, an amateur radio setup, uh, this is probably the one I would recommend because you just let it run and it actually picks up stuff all the time. And you can see the status of the sun. All right, for example, this was extracted from a burst that occurred uh, in 2017, and here you have the activity that you can see during the middle of the day. So, of course, I took Sid to my Great American ex uh, Eclipse trip um, in 2017, and uh, this is the antenna that you saw against my bookshelf set up at the uh, Eclipse site, and I let that run. I was just one of my assistants and uh, his antenna again. And this is very easily constructed and not too expensive. And they, they actually sell a kit, just a bunch of wire that you'd make maybe 25 turns of. It was like the old antennas on the back of, of uh, radios, and depending how old you are, maybe you remember what that looked like. And here's the data from the total solar eclipse, nighttime, and then they, the sun rises, Everything's quiet, and then totality. And again, what happens in totality? Well, of course, the sun, the photosphere is blocked. And it just so happened at totality, there was an eruption on the sun of, uh, of a flare, and the, I recorded it, so that's pretty cool. So in summary, the three types of amateur radio telescopes, uh, the, and they do it yourself to some degree, uh, the very high frequency, uh, 1.4 gigahertz, okay? Uh, the NASA Radio Jove experiment at uh, 20 megahertz, and the very low frequency at 10 to 40 kilohertz. But this one for a facility that uh, you want people to see what's going on, probably the best, the best and the one that will give you consistent results. This one will as well, but you have to wait a while to you know, see the, the information piled up. This one, uh, the very high frequency one, you can measure Doppler effect. You can uh, have students do... Uh, if they like to write programs in Python or whatever the new stuff is that people write in these days, then uh, they could get very, very uh, clever and actually uh, extract the Doppler shifts. And there's my observatory once again. Here are websites. And again, uh, through the recording, you'll be able to uh, look these up. Oh, and one final thing, uh, shameless plug. I, I've written a little book, little science fiction book if you're interested in the websites there as well. That's it. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak at my okay. old alma mater. <laughs> You'll have to come and visit us in person sometime. Oh, yeah. Well, sometimes I'm in Rhode Island. I can do that. <laughs>